All right, let's pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us and uh, helping us to understand the reading of your word. I pray, Lord, that as I preach, you fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me to preach with clarity and help us to understand your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, look at the last two verses there. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. The Bible says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin had reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The title of my sermon this evening is Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. So the, the, the phrase Amazing Grace calls to mind the famous and wonderful hymn written by John Newton. So in the late 18th century, that's about 1779, as records show, the English poet and Anglican clergyman named John Newton uh, published the hymn. He was involved in the Atlantic slave trade. And if you know anything about that, that was brutal, to say the least, for the, um, for actually, I mean, let me, <laughs> it was brutal for the people that were carried or transported as slaves. And it was in inhumane and the transportation itself was very bad. We're not even just talking about slavery, the transportation, because that was his job. He was taking people, whether bought, stolen, or captured, people from the, west, the coast of West Africa. And for some of us that are Nigerians, most of them were Nigerians. It's, it's amazing, but most of them came from um, Lagos, if you know that. So he was taking people from there and transferring them to the Americas. So most of uh, the slaves have their origin from Nigeria. Um, but it was bad. I mean, they were all packed up like sardines. People were dying of sicknesses. I mean, sheep could have a wreck and everyone dies too. It, it was just a very, and it was a long transportation. Anyway, people were treated there less than animals, less than beasts of the field. And I'm sure that if this was going on today, or if we could see this going on today, uh, we might call John Newton a reprobate. No questions asked. This guy, definitely a reprobate. That's what we'll probably say. But after John Newton called out to the Lord, he had, there was a storm one day, or one time he was transporting them, there was a storm in the sea, and he called out to the Lord to save him. As I said, people, they disregard God until they remember that there is a God when they need help. But he called out to God to save him. And from there, you know, he sought the Lord and he got saved. After he got saved, he changed his life, obviously, became a clergyman, joined the church, all of that. And um, he wrote this hymn from his experience, Amazing Grace. And we all uh, know the hymn very well. And um, I can imagine his joy being saved, knowing what he did, how he destroyed lives and families. Um, and, and he knows that he's saved. He's sure that he's saved. So what, has, what an amazing grace. Let's look at some verses from Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This amazing grace is available to all men, but it is through faith. Yes, Jesus died for everyone, but it is through faith. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it is through faith that we access this grace. And that's what the Bible says here. And we can stand justified before God. No matter what had happened in the past, no matter the sins that you've committed, even the saints you are going to commit, right? So Jesus died for all saints. He died before the foundations of the world. So therefore, he had died for all the saints for the future. Because people just think, oh, he died for the saints of the past. Then you have to keep working and asking for forgiveness for the saints of the future. No, he died for everything. He died for all the saints and we can stand justified before God, no matter the sins we committed. In fact, particular sins, no particular sin makes you rejected of God or, or makes you a reprobate. Let's put it that way. Now, because of sin, the wages of sin is death. So it's because of sin that you know, a man is bound for hell. Because of sin. But the grace of God is there to remove us from the path of death into life, as the Bible says. So we should not be condemned. 
Obviously, we are not supposed to glory in our sins. It's because I'm saying, oh, we have this amazing grace. You can stand justified before the Lord. We're not supposed to glory in our sins. We should despise them. We, uh, even the inward man, our spirit man, our inward man, as Bible says, you know, it, it, sin is an abomination to him. You know, the righteous man, the wicked man is an abomination to him. The, the, uh, so that's how we should be for us. We should despise it. We should feel bad if we know we're in sin. You know, uh, the Holy Spirit sh should do the work in us and we should not sear uh, our conscience or quench the Holy Spirit. So if we're going to speak of our sins, we should speak of them for necessary edification. It's not just talking about, oh, I did this thing, and I, but don't worry, I'm fine. You know, God is going to, I'm covered. It's covered, it's under the blood. You know, you don't say that. You know, you speak only for necessary edification if you're talking about your sins or your past life or things like that. So Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We have peace with God. He reconciled us back to God. So that's what Jesus did. And so we have peace with God. And we can rejoice in the joy of our salvation. No matter what life that we had lived, we can rejoice in the joy of our salvation. And that is why this grace is amazing. Look at verse 8, Romans chapter 5. The Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now I use this verse as a transition. I transition from, you know, the wages of sin is death, and we all deserve to go to hell. This is during... Uh, my soul winning presentation the wages of sin is death and we deserve to go to hell but does God want to send us to hell I use this verse as a transition it's almost like a conjunction but it is more than that this verse has a lot of weight and simple but very profound just like grace itself so Jesus died for us not because we were willing to change that is how amazing this grace is. You know, you tell somebody, okay, if you change or if you do this, then I'll give you all of this, right? So it, it, it's kind of like, if you do this, then I'll give you grace, I'll give you this, I'll give you, you know, what your heart desires. But there was no, there was no condition. While we were yet sinners, in our sin, Jesus died for us. Not because we're willing to change, but just because he wanted to save us. It is an amazing grace. Number two, not because all men will be saved. You know, when, when he died, when he went to the cross to die for us, when he came to this earth, in fact, to die for us, to suffer for us, it wasn't that, you know what, God told Jesus, you know, if you just do this, all men will be saved. Everybody, you will not waste one drop of your blood. You know, I'm not saying it's wasted. But to some people, to, for some people, it is wasted. Some people are even rejected while they are yet alive, and those are the reprobates. But not because uh, uh, all men will be saved that Jesus died for us. That is amazing grace. Knowing that I'm going to die for somebody, and that person is not going to even use it. So, and number three, not looking for a payback. Okay, yes, I'll die for you, but I'm doing it in faith. You know, I'm putting money in the stocks, it's in faith. Then I'll get a payback, you know? No, he wasn't doing it for a payback. We cannot pay back the grace that Jesus did for us. Pay back the gift of salvation. In fact, that is why it's called a gift. It is a gift. It is not a reward because of something you earned. And it's not a, re uh, it's not a, a, yeah, a reward. But if I do it, then you do it back for me. So that's not what is going on here. It's not good works. Yes, God wants us to do good works. But it's not to pay back what Jesus did for us. So it's not a requirement for salvation. And so Jesus died for us for these three reasons. Or, or amazing grace is amazing for these three reasons. Let's put it that way. And all this he did with foreknowledge. What do I mean? Knowing that only a few people would choose to believe. He did this with foreknowledge. Dying for us. Look in Luke chapter 13. You have to open it. I'll just read it. Luke chapter 13 verse 23 and 24. The Bible says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. So, in other words, only few be saved. So, they, they asked him straightforward, Jesus, are there few that be saved? After all that they've seen and heard and the rich is hard for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God, Jesus is saying, it's only few that will be saved. I, I've traveled for about a week, as you guys know, and I was preaching in, uh, in one of the funeral, the reception of the funeral event, and giving them a clear presentation of the gospel. And they were just rowdy, making noise. In fact, I was being driven out of the place. Oh, after like 10 minutes, time up, time up, you should leave. So 
they're not seeking God they're not seeking the truth but that's why Jesus says strive to enter in at the straight gate it's not difficult you just have that opportunity but they, just, they, they prefer to do something else they prefer not to hear anymore and that's why only few be saved I wish I had opportunities like that you know before I was saved you know I wish I could that someone could you know explain the gospel but not many will get that chance so this grace is amazing Jesus dying for us knowing that only few will be saved only few people will use this let's see some examples of how amazing this grace is in the Bible the first one I want to point out is Manasseh Manasseh if you remember who Manasseh is a king one of the kings of Judah after Hezekiah the son of Hezekiah this guy was pure evil open to 2nd Kings in fact I'm gonna read it 2nd Kings chapter 21 Second Kings chapter 21, uh, Manasseh was, <laughs> uh, it, it would seem that Manasseh will be burning in hell after I read this. Just So Second Kings chapter 21, the Bible says, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign and reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Heb, Hebzab, Hebziba. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up the altars of Baal, and made a groove as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of all which the Lord said, In Jerusalem will I put my name. And he built altars for all the host of heaven in the, two, in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and use enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of the groove that he had made in a house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Uh, neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I give their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them, and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. But he hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake by his servants the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh, king of Judah, had done these abominations, and had done wickedly above all the Amorites did, which were before him, and had made Judah to sin with his idols. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth of it both his ears shall tingle. And I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria, and the plummet of the house of Ahab, and I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipeth a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. And I will forsake the remnant of my inheritance, and deliver them into the hand of their enemies, and they shall become a, a prey, and a spoil to all their enemies because they have done that which was evil in my sight and have provoked me to anger since the day their fathers came forth out of Egypt even unto this day moreover Manasseh shed innocent blood very much till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to the other beside his sin wherewith he made Judah to sin in doing that which was evil in the sight of the Lord now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and all that he did and and his sin that he sinned are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the king of Judah so that is in second kings the story of manasseh so you're reading through your bible you read this and you're like definitely this guy's in hell <laughs> like oh, oh so after all this this is the rest of the acts of manasseh and all that he did you're like oh wow this guy is definitely in hell this guy can't be saved so we get look at uh, second kings chapter 23 2 Kings chapter 23, because Manasseh, what he did was a straw that broke the camel's back. Because of what Manasseh did, Israel, uh, sorry, Judah was going to be captive, was going to be sent out of their land. That God said that they will stay in that land forever as long as they keep his commandments. So Manasseh, his deeds were the straw that broke the camel's back. Look at what happened, because in, this was the time of Josiah, another great and mighty king. He did so many good things. And the Bible says in verse 23, that is 2 Kings 23, 23, In the 18th year of King Josiah, wherein his Passover, wherein this Passover was holding to the Lord in Jerusalem, moreover the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations 
that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses neither after him arose there any like him notwithstanding verse 26 the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his, his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah. Why? Because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city, this city Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. So, Open to 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33. So by the time you get here, you're like, definitely. I mean, Manasseh is so bad. 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33. Manasseh is so bad, he cannot be saved. I mean, this. how can God save somebody like this? <laughs> you know? You're like, oh, this guy, he must be burning in hell. You know? With Michael Jackson and all of that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding, actually. Um... So he sounds like a reprobate, even worse than the sons of Eli, right? But look at what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. The same story, the same account, but the Bible gives us more information. In verse 9, 2 Chronicles 33 verse 9, So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, that is to be in error, uh, error I should say, and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed unto him, and he was entreated of him, that God was entreated of him, and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem, into his kingdom, then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Let's pause here first. One could argue that Manasseh was saved all this time. It, 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 it's not like, oh, this is when he got saved. I mean, I could be that one. I could argue. Yeah, and if someone says that, I'll be like, hey, I have no argument with that. This guy might have been saved since Hezekiah was his father, before he was 12. But he just chose to go the wrong way doing all these evil things so you could argue that but on the other hand after doing all these things and causing the wrath of god to be upon jerusalem you know that god will not even look at the great mighty deeds of josiah how he turned around jerusalem for for the better that he was ready to destroy jerusalem and god still brought him back why why i'm saying one could argue that he was saved because if he wasn't saved i mean he would have been like the sons of Eli. God just wanted to destroy him. But for the fact that God saved, like saved him physically, brought him back from captivity, gave him back his kingdom. <laughs> I mean, after doing all these evil things, shedding much blood, because he's the son of God. That's what you could argue. But even if you say he's, he wasn't saved back then, and he was doing all those things, and doing all the abominations, worshipping and sending his sons through the fire, that means worshipping Baal, he still got saved. Right? And that is how amazing the grace of God is. After doing all these things. So you look at John Newton. You say, wow. After doing all those evil things to the slaves, to the people that he captured, uh, he still got saved? Oh, I doubt that. No. Look at Manasseh. Pure evil. Led people. Shed much innocent blood. Bible says from one end of Judah to the other end. It reminds me of the wrath of God. The blood flowing in the streets. And that is what Manasseh did, and God still gave him back that kingdom. And it goes on to say in verse 14, Now after this he built a wall without the city of David, and on the west side of Gihon, okay, because of time. So Manasseh restored everything, although the people were still serving false gods, so because of what he did, he couldn't even change the, uh, the nation uh, as, as much, but he returned back to the Lord. So that is how amazing the grace of God is. If God can save Manasseh, I mean, Ahab shouldn't be too far off, right? I still, I still argue that Ahab is saved. <laughs> anyway, first, uh, look at the second point, the second example, Adam and Eve. So we went to Manasseh. Now let's go to Adam and Eve. It's a simple command. Don't eat of this fruit, of this tree, sorry. 
The day you shall eat of this tree, thou shalt surely die. It's very simple. There are many other nice trees. I mean, nice fruits. I, I know we live in the Northeast, but I mean, go to Florida, go to the tropics, go to California. There are many, it's beautiful. Natural, just imagine how Eden was that God built himself. It wasn't just some random land, he just drew a line. No, God built that garden with all those nice trees and fruits and good to eat and told him to eat anything else except just that one tree. Even the tree of life was available for him. But so simple a command, but they broke it. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So Adam was not deceived. He intentionally broke it. But what did God do? I mean, God at that point could have said, it's just Adam and Eve. Restart. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, don't lie, when you were a kid and you were playing video games and you just mess up, you're like, ah! You know, I'm just in phase one, right? Uh, you just hit power button, your power button, you know, everyone's like, complain. Anyway, that's the point. Restart. God could have easily done that. And, you know, he doesn't even have to let anybody know. You're just like, you know. <laughs> because God, God told some people that you commit a sin, I can wipe you off the face of the earth, nobody will remember you. And he doesn't have to write it in the Bible. And nobody will know. There are many things that, you know, we don't know that's not written in the Bible. How about Job, how he came about and all of that. So, anyway, my point is so easy to restart, but God showed grace. It's amazing. That he still decided to save them. He's like, ah, I just messed up. Adam and Eve, okay, you know what? I'll make them tall or something. So they don't see the tree. Or they'll see the, they'll see the forest for the trees, right? So they'll say, ah, don't let me just get stuck on just one tree. Anyway, my point is, the grace is amazing. And God had mercy on them. Not just that he had mercy on them, but he showed them grace. Because what's the difference between grace and mercy? Mercy is when you don't get a punishment that you deserve, right? Grace is when you get uh, positive. That is, you get something good that you do not deserve. So I'll show you mercy. You don't get the punishment that you deserve. That means I, I don't give you uh, that punishment. That's mercy. But he gave them grace on top of that. I mean, both of them, that's just how I define it. But they kind of like, the meanings are um, intertwined. All right, look at the third example. Apostle Paul. The Bible says, as a chief sin, I open to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Paul persecuted Christ and the church. So it wasn't just persecuting the church. Jesus said, Paul, Paul, why persecutest thou me? Right? So Paul was persecuting Christ. So don't just think, oh, he was just doing this to the church. No, he was doing it to Jesus Christ himself. Even to the death of believers. Right? Persecuted them to the death, as the Bible says. Approving of the death of Stephen as recorded in the Bible. But he said even for the death of other believers. Sending them to prison, destroying families. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus. So Paul's writing to Timothy. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who had enabled me. For that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. That means he was injuring people. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And Paul knows that very well. You can't argue that he was saved before and he was just lost his way. No, he was unsaved. He was doing evil things, killing people, destroying families, hunting them down. And Paul knows I'm chief. If I can be saved, then you guys can be saved. Oh, you think he didn't say it? Let's keep reading. How be it? For this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ, my shoe fought all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to, to life everlasting. So Paul is saying, see, God is using me as the example. See, if Paul can be saved, you, you guys, you Greeks, you and all of you can be saved. Because I know what I did. I was hunting people down. I was killing them. I was saying, you cannot say that name. You can and he still saved me. That is amazing grace. He gave me mercy. Then he gave me this grace. That is amazing grace. So Paul is an example of the amazing grace that we have. I don't know what you've done. What you're thinking. You know, we can stand in the presence of God. Stand in that grace. And that's why in his letters he says, I pray for more grace. More grace. Grace be unto you. Grace to the church. Right? We can stand in that. Look at the fourth example, Cornelius. You can find that story in the book, uh, Acts chapter 10 and 11. Cornelius was a self-righteous man. He did 
very good. I mean, did all he did dead works because he was I call that dead works according to the Bible in Hebrews chapter six. So he was doing dead works, but he was a good man, well respected. Everyone loved him. You know, he was justified in the eyes of man. You no, know? where of you know, not to God but to man. And God still reached out to him. He could have just been an example that, you know what, let me show you that works, uh, like obeying the law and all of that does not get you to heaven. And that could have been an example to us. But no, God wants to save everyone. The Bible says it's his will that none will perish, that sinners will not die. So he went out to reach Cornelius. Even when Cornelius thought he was right, he was doing everything right, and he thought he had found a way. But he went out still, out of his way to reach Cornelius. In a time when even the apostles did not want to go and reach Cornelius. But God is like, no, this guy, I'm going to save him. It's amazing. The ones in sin, the ones pure ignorance, trying to do right, thinking it's by their works. Simple commands. The ones pure evil that you're not sure, was he saved before? I mean, God is reaching everybody. Everybody. That is amazing grace. That's why Jesus came and that's why Jesus died for us. And the last one, the last example I want to give. And there are many examples, right? I mean, Abraham, how God saved him, just called him out. His father was an idol worshiper. He called him out. Uh, even Lot. And just Lot. He was not saying like just Lot, only him. No, he said just. That means he was justified. And it's, we can stand justified because of that grace. You know, Noah, all of them. Peter, Matthew, Simon, the Canaanite. Right? All these people... It's amazing grace. Peter is like, oh no, don't, don't come near me. I'm not worthy. It's like, it's you I want. Right? God saved all of them. I mean, who was saved without amazing grace? Everyone. But I'll just finish up with this last example because I want to give you different aspects. This was the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross. At the 11th hour of his life. Can you imagine that? You say, you know what? There's no way you leave your life so bad. And you're suffering for your sin in jail? Yeah, there's no hope for you. No, there is hope for you. That's how amazing that grace is. The 11th hour. You know they died before Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. No, I say that, say that wrong. Jesus died before them. So they would have lost the opportunity to be saved. Because who is going to talk to them about salvation on the cross? Everyone's crying for Jesus. That's the ones that are saved. <laughs> right? And, and Jesus dies and they're like, they're like, oh, there's no hope for them. So... I would say even the 11th hour of Jesus' life. And their own 11th hour too. And they got saved. So it's not too late. You can talk to people. That is how amazing this grace is. Now, note this. God is not mocked. You cannot mock God. You cannot just live your life anyhow and say, you know, on my deathbed, I'm going to get saved because God's grace is so amazing. First of all, number one, deathbed is not guaranteed. It's a privilege. My dad didn't have a deathbed. He died of a heart attack. <laughs> so don't say, oh, my deathbed. Who told you you have a deathbed? <laughs> so that's number one. Then number two, you think you can just mock God. And at a certain point, if you keep rejecting, waiting for your deathbed, the Bible says, and I know I'm not talking to you guys, but I just want to say it out there so you tell people when you're talking to them. The Bible says uh, that you can be rejected. You keep rejecting God. At a certain point, God will reject you. So I just want to put that in there and just say, oh, I'm just going to be the thief at the cross and on my deathbed. No, you might not even have a deathbed. All right. Equally amazing is how this grace is rejected. You know, it's an amazing grace. And people get saved. As you can see, even in the last hour, people are getting saved. But equally amazing is how people reject this grace. And I'll just give three examples of how people reject this. The story of Cain and Abel. Open to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. It's another simple command. And I'll say it's, it's a simple command. Just go and offer a lamb as a sacrifice. A very simple command. Do you know why it was simple? Because Cain did the more difficult one. Or was it just to plug leaves? No. At that time, there was still the curse on the ground for man's sake. It was hard to grow something off the ground. And Cain grew something off of the ground, nice stuff, did all those hard work, and brought the leaves and all of that, and came to uh, offer it to God. And God did not have respect for the offering. Although Cain worked hard. So probably Cain was mad. It's like, do you know how hard it is <laughs> to, to get all these leaves? <laughs> all the, this nice, I don't know, the concoction that he brought up. You know, the many wonderful works that he did. And Cain was angry. And look at what God says to him to show you how amazing this grace was. In verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, that is Genesis 4 verse 6, Why art thou wrought, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, 
shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So now that last sentence there kind of gets people off. It's like, what does that mean? Right? God here was still trying to save Cain. God was like, warning Cain, hey, if you had just done what I told you to do, because the Bible said he told them to do it. In Hebrews chapter 11, faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. They were told to sacrifice, and uh, Abel chose to sacrifice by faith. That means he heard the word of God and he did it. So it wasn't just their option. So if you had done what I told you to do, you will be accepted. And Cain was the first son. Remember, God had just promised Eve, or promised man, that Eve would have a baby, or the seed is in Eve, and that seed will crush the head of the serpent, right? So who is God going to use next? Because it's the next family, the next line. The next person was God normally uses is the first son, right? So Cain is the first son. That seed is supposed to come through Cain. And God was trying to save Cain and restore Cain so that the seed will come through, through Cain. And that's why, you know, Cain was annoyed with Abel. And God came to Cain and told Cain, hey, be careful. You're going to hurt your brother. Seen is lying at the door. See, if you are done right, the Bible is saying, unto thee, Abel will have a, his desire unto thee. That means you will rule over Abel. If you do the right thing. This is the same thing God said with, to, to, to woman and to Eve and Adam. He told the woman that unto him shall your des desire be, and he shall rule over you. So, now he's telling Cain, Abel, his desire will be unto you. That means you'll be the first son, you'll be in charge and all of that. The seed will come through you, and you will rule over him. But you're angry with him because he did right with God, and sin is lying at the door, and you want to do the wrong thing. If you do the right thing, you restore your position, and everything is fine. That is amazing grace. That, he could have just got there and just say, see this guy, I told him to do something simple, and he's not doing it, and, he, and he's mad at Abel that did the right. You know what, I'll just save Abel, this guy's gone. No, he's still trying to reach him. Still trying to reach him. So, um, I'm just showing you how people reject it. God coming down to talk to him. And that is the same when you hear the word of God. Bible says you don't be like Cain, but that's another sermon. But let me focus here because of time. Now, the next example of someone that rejecting the word of God, rejecting amazing grace is King Agrippa. Almost thou persuaded me to be a Christian. Almost. Oh, almost I would have taken this amazing grace. So easy. Almost. It's like, how would you reject it? I mean, you could have just told uh, Paul, uh, Peter, oh no, Paul, you have just told Paul, I'm going to see you personally somewhere else. You know, like Nicodemus. <laughs> he just rejected it. Amazing. And that's how people are at the door. You finish presenting everything. Is that? Uh, they're like, uh, I'm going to have to sleep on it. It's like, oh. <laughs> you know, I'll read my Bible more, you know. It's like, how do you reject it? Do you understand? See, Agrippa, I know you believe. I know you believe me. That's what Paul was saying. And he's like, almost. Then the last example is Judas Iscariot. Oh my goodness. You lived with Jesus for three years. With Jesus. This was not three years when he was in his 20s. This was three years in his 30s. That is during his ministry. When he was actually healing people. Now, before I even go for that, it's not that living with Jesus in his 20s will mean that you can't get saved. <laughs> right? I mean, Jesus was perfect. He didn't commit any sin. So you're living with this guy that's perfect, not committing any sin, and probably talking about the grace of God, and you still didn't get saved. But no, Ju Judas lived with Jesus, walking up and down with him, seeing all the miracles, sent to perform miracles, all of that, and still did not believe. Is that not amazing? <laughs> I mean, see, it's not everybody that will live with me that will get saved. I'll tell you that. They'll be like, wow, this guy, you still sin. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm mad. I still make mistakes. But Jesus, perfect, doing miracles and casting out devils, and he still did not believe. Uh, it's amazing. It amazes me. And that's how I mean, because the grace is so amazing that it's amazing me how he doesn't get saved. So there's not, not much more I can say about Judas Iscariot. But let's finish up here. Look at the last two verses again Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Romans 5, 20 and 21. 
Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin had reigned unto death, even so my grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Open to Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Titus 2 11. So there is always more grace than sin. And God forbids that we should continue in sin that grace may abound. So that is the next chapter, chapter 6 verse 1. So there's always more grace than sin. That is how amazing this grace is. Oh, I'm just, you commit more sin, you commit more sin. But guess what? There's much more grace. It's like, as he sees the, 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 the sin, it's just expanded. It's just, it's amazing. That's what I'm trying to say. It always covers sin. Doesn't mean we should live in sin. In fact, what does the grace teach us? Titus 2.11, the Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared to all men, Teaching us that. So the grace is teaching us something. No, there's much more grace than sin. So we just can do anything we want to do. No, that grace, the more it is, the more it's teaching us. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And we know how this present world is. It's wicked, it's an adulterous and evil generation. Say, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, Paul said that he, he, uh, a crown of life is waiting for him and also for many as love his appearing. So the same kind of rewards that Paul, uh, Paul is going to get, we can all get if we love his appearing. How are you going to love his appearing? It's because you've done everything that he said you should do. You've, you've done everything that you know is right. And you're waiting for his appearing. Or you'll be like a servant that is afraid when his master shows up. It's like because he didn't, you know, sweep the place and <laughs> you know he didn't do he didn't occupy it till he came. So now the master is here is like trying to run away or trying to hide. But if you love the appearing of the Lord, that means you're doing all the right things. And that's what the grace is teaching us, that we should be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. That's the grace. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So this is what grace is teaching us. Because it's amazing, doesn't mean you should abuse it. Don't, don't uh, trick, take your liberty with um, lasciviousness and abuse the liberty that we have in Christ. Instead, we should be zealous of good works. Amen. With such amazing grace, let's remember how Jesus paid the price. It's amazing. It's, it's, a, it's a gift of God, eternal life, but what Jesus went through to give us this amazing grace? Breaking of his body. I mean, when I hear that phrase, this is my body broken for you. It's like, think of a body breaking. I, I, I mean, now, none of his bones were broken. We're talking about, you know, the, the, the wounds and how he was abused, to, to say, put it mildly. But think of my, like he was beating up so much that his face was unrecognizable. Not just unrecognizable, I don't recognize who he is. No, you're like, is that a human being? More like, it's like, what kind of face is that? His face was disfigured. How much they punched him and beat his face. And his blood shed for us. Almost like he was slaughtered. I mean, he was. <laughs> like, you know how you shed, like, yeah. Pierced him, blood bleeding everywhere. And all he says for us is just do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. He's not asking, oh, make sure I do it every day because you have to remember me every day. Yes, we should remember him every day. But he's not saying you must do it every day. He says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Just remembering how you got this amazing grace. That last night, he said, I'm not going to eat again. I'm not going to drink from the, the vine anymore until I come into the kingdom. So it's time for our Holy Communion and let's open to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. Just want to read this, then I'll pray for the Holy Communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. Bible says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Eat, sorry, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. 
this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for coming down to die for our sins. Thank you for showing us the way, for giving us life. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for your mercies upon us. Thank you for your grace, your amazing grace. Daddy, we don't deserve this grace. In fact, that's why it's called grace. We don't deserve the love that you've shown us. Even while we were yet sinners, you came and died for us. We can't thank you enough. Daddy, I pray, Lord, that it will always be in our hearts. We'll always remember what you've done. We'll always be satisfied with the grace that we have because your grace is sufficient for us it is amazing i pray oh lord that nothing we will not see anything in this world over the grace that you've given us daddy we've gathered together as a church congregation of saints we're here remembering what you have done for us and this night many 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 years ago daddy you had the last supper i pray oh lord that as we eat of the bread and drink of the wine that's the fruit juice i pray that will remember you. It will, it will be done in reverence. Help us to understand that night what you went through so that it will help us to live our lives in a way that pleases you. I, I commit the bread and the wine into your hands. Bless it. Let it nourish us and um, let it help the church, nourish the church spiritually and edify us. In Jesus' mighty name I've prayed. Amen.